Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Rob Ryan Silva. I work for a company called Development Alternatives Incorporated, or DAI, where my job is to build hardware and build capacities to build hardware uh, in support of international development projects. So projects that are intended uh, to help developing countries be healthier, better governed, more prosperous places to live. Uh, and I started this little hardware unit of a company about five years ago uh, on the, with the recognition that there were tools and approaches that were emerging in producing hardware uh, that were changing who could make hardware and the kind of context that you could uh, make it in and uh, the, the quantities that you needed to make it in in order to make it financially viable. Um, and it, it was apparent to me that um, this would, having this capability in-house would enable us to apply hardware to problems that had previously been unaddressed. And in our line of work, we see a lot of those. And I think that's proved to be true. Uh, so as we look at back at the last 10 years of open source hardware, I thought it might be interesting to take a look at um, one of our most, in fact, our, our most successful design uh, and look at some of the ways that it's changed over time. Because I think it illustrates some of the ways that these new paradigms are different and how opening up that design platform uh, allows hardware to be responsive to a different kind of a design context. Uh, so in the five years we've been running the lab, easily the most popular design has been for a sonar water level sensing gauge. So we've put this to work in a few different applications, but the most popular has been flood early warning. So the version you see here on the screen uh, was developed for use in Cambodia, and that's where we've had the most uptake of this. Uh, and the idea is that we hang this usually off the side of a bridge, and it uses sonar to return the level of water under that bridge. Uh, it sends that information on a regular basis to a server using a cell phone network. Uh, and it can be stored there for analysis. You can have a look at it later. Uh, but if the water reaches levels that have been identified as yellow or red alert levels in the system, uh, it triggers an alert. And in Cambodia, that can mean uh, 10 or 15,000 people downstream getting a phone call within a, a, a matter of a few minutes, alerting them to rising flood water that may come their way in a few hours to a day. Uh, and so we're hovering just shy of 100,000 subscribers to that early warning system in Cambodia, uh, where the local NGO that we worked with to, uh, to, to develop this um, has 19 active sensors right now, and they think they can cover the entire country with, with fewer than 30, uh, and they hope to have that done by the end of the year. I understand they're also looking at extending into some other countries in the region. And so this is a really simple design. It's, uh, it's based on a Seedwino stalker, which is essentially just an Arduino with some better power management um, uh, circuitry that helps you uh, when you want to put something like this in the field. Um, one of the things that I would say that we've learned is that it is indeed possible to make hardware that matters, even with these kinds of simple modular components. So there's 100,000 Cambodians today who get uh, flood warnings from what's basically an Arduino and, a, and an Adafruit phono module. Uh, and that's been going on for, for years. So the first time we piloted this, we, uh, we piloted in Honduras and we installed five prototypes around the country. Uh, and one place uh, where we put it was a, a little town called Corquín near the border with uh, Guatemala and El Salvador. And we put this device up and it worked. Uh, but almost immediately, we started getting some weird results uh, back from it. So most of the time, it was fine. But frequently, we would get a stream height that showed the water was at the maximum range of the sensor, which would mean that the surface of the water was below the bottom of the stream bed. Uh, and so we plotted these bogus readings out by time and um, to see if we could figure out what was going on. And it was a pretty striking pattern. So there's a very definite peak around three in the afternoon. So you get very few of these bogus readings coming in at night, uh, but they increase throughout the day at a peak at three and then they drop off. And we thought about a number of things that could be causing that. And you know, we thought maybe there's uh, more vibration on the bridge at midday. Uh, maybe the, the midday heat is causing something inside the unit to fail. And we eliminated each of these possibilities one by one and it kind of left me scratching my head. What's going on in rural Honduras at three in the afternoon that's not happening at nine in the morning or midnight? So uh, and then I remembered uh, we had been in another small town where we had put up a sensor. And um, small towns in Central America, they tend to be centered on a, a, a main square. 
Uh, and so you, like the one you see here on the screen, um, and there's usually a church on one side, often it's got a school um, uh, with that church and there'll be a city hall on another side and there's shops all around the square, some little restaurants. Uh, and we stopped at the square in this particular town twice, once in the morning and once in the afternoon. Uh, and on the second occasion, the square was full of school kids in uniforms, doing what school kids do everywhere where they got five minutes themselves, which is play with their phones. And I asked my colleagues uh, why there were so many school kids sitting in the square. And, and uh, they explained to me that it was siesta time. And many people don't bother going home for siesta. They just kind of chill wherever they're at and wait for wherever they're supposed to be to open up again. So I should take a minute to explain the logic of uh, the device as it was at that time. Like, so like any battery powered device, we're trying to maximize our sleep time. So once a minute, this thing, uh, the real time clock in this thing wakes it up with an interrupt uh, and it checks to see if it needs to send an alert, either because it's time for a scheduled alert or because the water is high enough that you don't wanna wait for the next scheduled alert to, to get the word out. <clears throat> uh, and if it's time for reading, it's gonna take a little while for that cell phone module to establish a connection with uh, the network. Uh, so uh, in order to minimize the amount of time this thing's gonna to have to be awake, we start up that cell phone module, we start that process, then we take our reading, uh, it's actually the mode of seven readings, um, and then send it. And in every other place we ever tested this thing, um, that was fine, but in Corkeen, we had a problem. So let's say you're trying to make a, a phone call in an urban area, and your phone makes contact with the local cell tower and asks to start a connection. And if the tower is busy, it might say, I'm sorry, no, I'm not gonna accept your connection, I'm, I'm too busy right now. And so what your phone is gonna do is it's gonna increase the power uh, until it can find another tower and hopefully it's gonna make a connection there. In Corquín though, uh, there was no other tower close by, so the unit had to boost the power by quite a lot in order to reach the next tower. And that meant that there wasn't enough power left over to run the sonar. Uh, so this was easy to fix. Uh, I just went in and changed the order. Um, uh, we set it so it would take our readings before it started the GSM module and all those bogus readings went away. Uh, and I was super proud of the way that I, I figured this out. And I described it to one of my colleagues as uh, anthropological circuit analysis. I was, I was pretty proud of that. But I suspect production engineers um, would have another term for it. Um, so when a design uses uh, modular pre-made parts like this, you don't have control over all the engineering choices in your design. And in some cases, you don't even know what they are. Uh, and in this case, the battery would have had more than enough juice to power the cell phone module at full uh, power, as well as the sonar and the microcontroller and everything else. But um, I was running it all through the power bus of the Seedwino Stalker, and I think what was happening is there was a protection diode in there that couldn't support uh, the forward current needed to run both at the same time. So that changed the code for uh, the device for all the future iterations. Uh, the next place we tried the design was in Cambodia, and where, as I mentioned, we've seen the greatest uptake. Uh, and for that reason, it's also where we've learned the most. Um, so one thing I learned from the Cambodia deployments is that 85% uh, of the time, when a unit completely stops sending data, it's because somebody forgot to pay the phone bill. Uh, and that might sound silly, uh, but that's actually had a real impact on design choices I've made since then. Uh, because we sort of, when we're doing these designs, we accept that cellular data costs money, even though it's a lot cheaper basically everywhere but the US. Uh, but it's easy to ignore the fact that there is a non-trivial administrative uh, cost involved uh, when you have a lot of units and just keeping the phone bill paid in countries where the norm for cell phone service is prepaid, which is true in most developing countries. Uh, when you have units up in a tropical environment for a few years, stuff's gonna start living in them. Uh, and so while we've discovered that our enclosures uh, seal nice uh, and keep everything out of the enclosure, the outside does need to get cleaned every once in a while. And so that is part of uh, our maintenance protocol. Uh, the NGO, local NGO that we work with, um, <clears throat> had one unit uh, that they installed uh, where 
it stopped sending data almost uh, immediately. Uh, and they went back out to take a look and this is what they found. And they asked around town uh, and discovered that some uh, local kids had been using this as a diving board. Uh, and so that has impacts on choices that you make in where you install these and how you install them because you don't want um, you know, local hooligans uh, breaking your equipment, but you also don't uh, want your equipment breaking uh, local hooligans. But the most significant design iteration that came out of Cambodia was when our local uh, par partner engaged a company in Phnom Penh to make some software and hardware upgrades. The most notably, they were able to get that Seedwino Stalker to update its software over the air. Uh, and that's the power of open source, as we all understand that um, you are allowing opening uh, your your design uh, to people in context that you could never bring to it yourself. I think that's really um, that's really exciting. I'll talk about one more country that has had an impact on uh, the state of the design as it stands right now, and that's Nepal. So the first unique thing about Nepal is that the topography there is really dramatic, and we had a hard time finding places to put units where they would be within the 10 meter range of the sensor. Uh, and wouldn't get swept away by the nearest flood. And we found one, uh, it's a riverbed in Bardia National Park that's dry for about 80% of the year, but does sometimes uh, flood dramatically during the rain season. So we had this unit up for more than a year, uh, when I, and I got a call from the team saying that they received an alert in the middle of the night, even though there wasn't any flooding. Uh, and uh, this pilot unit only sends alerts to uh, about half a dozen people, so it wasn't a huge deal, but it was kind of weird. And I went back and looked at the data, and I saw that while there was water in the stream, there was about 40 centimeters of water, um, there had been one sudden spike of about 240 centimeters and uh, for the space of just one reading, and then it went back to normal. Um, so I should say that there's the software has a validation routine to try to ensure that um, you don't get alert because of a bird passing by or a plastic bag that gets blown in front of the sensor. Um, so if a, there's an alert condition that's detected, the unit takes a series of five validation readings at five second intervals. Um, so if any of them don't agree with the alert condition, that alert just gets tossed out. Um, But at this point, we'd had more than a dozen units in Cambodia. Some of those had been up for almost three years. And this unit had been in place for more than a year, and we'd never seen a false alarm like this. So I had to apologize to the team, but I didn't really have any answers for them. And then a week later, they told me it happened again. And I went through the data, and I found out that there was actually a third spike that hadn't triggered an alert. And each time, it was about the same. There was about half a meter of water in the stream, and then there was a spike of about two and a half meters. And we went through a bunch of possibilities uh, and we eliminated those. And I made kind of a weird phone call to the Smithsonian and we finally settled on a working theory. Um, we think it's elephants. So there's just a little bit of water in the stream and it's right in the middle of the stream where the sensor is. So that's the only part of the stream that has any water is right under the sensor. Um, and so we think elephants are watering in a drink and they're standing under the sensor just long enough to trigger alert and then they're walking away. Um, so I did something that I never imagined I would ever do, which is uh, write an anti-elephant validation routine in the software to filter out any transient pachyderms. Um, and one of the reasons that I believe that this approach to hardware is so useful for the work that we do at DAI is because um, off-the-shelf hardware often doesn't work well in these developing country environments. And I think this case of the thirsty Nepalese elephants uh, is a pretty good illustration as to why. Many of these contacts are not the ones that Western engineers are usually designing devices for. Um, so that's, uh, that's what I got. Thank you very much. I'll be on the Discord for any questions. I do want to take a moment to thank the organizers for putting together uh, at extremely short notice what seems to me to be a very complicated uh, um, endeavor to do this remotely. Uh, and I think they've done a great job. And I know they must have put in a lot of work for that. I know you all uh, will clap along with me for that. Thank you very much.